I was skipping the special, so, so it's going to... But uh, the song I was wanting to sing was, uh, the word says, show a little bit of love and kindness. Never go along with hatred's blindness. Take a little time to reach for joy and wear a happy face. Give a little help to a friend who's weary. Uh, oh, I miss, missed a couple lines, but... Uh, I'm sure you've heard that song before, Brother Tom. Come on. Sorry, I took a little while because I thought we were having a special, so I was. Anyway, that's okay. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, if you would. Now we talked last week about Paul's prayer for the church at Colossae and we're going to look at this once again today but we're going to look at one point of that and that's we're going to talk about walking worthy of the Lord. So if you begin reading with me in verse number 9 of the book of Colossians chapter 1 it says for this cause we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all his might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and light. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word this morning, I pray you will speak to our hearts. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for loving us. I do thank you for saving our souls. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Now I do pray that you'll bless our time here and we would take what you've given us, apply it in our lives, and we go out beyond these doors, Lord, that we would share the gospel with those around us. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, as again, as I said last week, we looked at Paul's prayer for the Colossian church, but it wasn't just for the church as a whole, but also for individual believers. But that prayer wasn't limited to this group of people. It went to the churches throughout the world at that time. That was Paul's desire that they would know the will of God. That was his first thing that he asked, that they had the knowledge of the will of God. It's difficult to be in the will of God if you don't know what the will of God is, is it? So he wanted them to absolutely know the will of God for their lives, for their church. And again, it wasn't just limited to the Colossian church, but the churches around, but it transcends through the ages to Gospel Light Baptist Church today and all of the godly churches that are around us. Now, I'm not talking about some of these false churches out there. I'm talking about those that are filled with believers. That's his prayer for us, that we would know the will of God. Secondly, he said not only to know the will of God, but to have wisdom. And wisdom tells us that we would have the good judgment to do the will of God. Now, if you know what God's will is, it does not make sense to not do the will of God, does it? If you want to please God, you're going to do his will. But you need to know what that will is. And then he gives us the third thing, which is the spiritual understanding. And that understanding is how to achieve the will of God. So God... Or Paul's prayer is that we know the will of God, that we have the wisdom to do the will of God, and the understanding on how to achieve the will of God. But then he says, the fourth thing in this prayer was, in verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord. That's a very powerful statement, a very powerful thing to pray for. He said, I pray you walk worthy of the Lord. 
Now that phrase, walk worthy, means to conduct ourselves in a manner that's appropriate and becoming the Lord. All too often I think that we take for granted that because we call ourselves a Christian and we act like a Christian sometimes or when it's convenient for us, that we are walking worthy of the Lord. But this is so much deeper than just the surface walk or the casual walk. He says, I want you to walk worthy. And the word worthy there is, again, the idea that we are representing the Lord in everything we do. Everywhere you go, you are an ambassador for God. You're an ambassador to a dark and dying world. When you go to the grocery store, you're God's representative. When you go into the restaurant, and maybe when you go there today and you start to think about calling over there and criticizing your waitress, remember, you are an ambassador, a representative of God. And the workplace, a representative of God. In the home, you're a representative of God. Not just here in the church, everywhere we go. So it's important that we conduct ourselves in an appropriate manner that is benefiting him, glorifying him. You see, when we do not represent him properly, when we're out there, we are bringing disgrace to the name of God. Have you thought about that? When you go out there and you have your little temper tantrum in the store, or wherever it might be, how does that reflect upon God? When you start going out there and someone says something to you and you, you have this, I'm not saying you use foul language, but you just have this harsh reply. You want to strike back, right? That's the human nature. But how does that reflect on God? Now there's many reasons that we could, I could give you why it's important that we walk worthy of God. He's a holy God. He is a righteous God. He is a loving God. He is a merciful God. He is a God of grace. He is a God of salvation. And we could go on and on and on and talk about why God is worthy. <clears throat> but let me say this to you this morning. If for no other reason than the sacrifice that God made, God the Father, by sending his only begotten Son as a gift of grace and an act of love to be a sacrifice for you and I and all of mankind, a sin or payment for our sin debt on Calvary, if for no other reason than that, he is worthy that we walk in a manner pleasing to him. If Jesus Christ alone, his sacrifice, you think about what he did. He left the glory of heaven where he put his, the fact that he was equal with God, 100% God, on an equal level of God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. He put himself under the submission of God the Father. To come to this earth and dwell as a man, being likewise subjected to all the temptations that you and I are subjected to, and yet he did not sin. So that he could be a sacrifice for your sins and mine. He could take on our sin, pay our sin debt on the rugged cross of Calvary. Suffered an agonizing agonizing death but if you don't believe that God's son Jesus Christ died an agonizing death why don't you take a look take an account he suffered not only physically but mentally emotionally and spiritually on that cross every aspect was agonizing for him the physical aspect we can understand. We know that was a horrible death. And I don't, if you've never done it, I would encourage you to go look. There have been medical studies of what Jesus went through 
physically on the cross and prior to being on the cross. And usually you'll find them a lot. You can find them on the internet. You'll find a lot of it when we get closer to Easter. You'll see those accounts. Take a look at them. Read them. Read them for yourself. You'll see how painful and violent his death was. But he had the mental anguish as well. You understand, the Bible tells us that when he prayed before he was arrested, his prayer was so intense. There was so much stress, physical stress, along with his prayer, that he was sweating drops of blood. So there was a mental aspect to that as well. But there was also an emotional anguish that was involved. Can you imagine Jesus Christ, a man that knew no sin, he had no sin nature, is suddenly sin. He is bearing the brunt of your sins, mine, and all of mankind's. What a horrible weight that was. And it took an emotional toll upon him. But not only that, you think about this. You realize there was never a time that Jesus Christ was separated from God the Father. And yet, while he was on the cross, because he became our sin, God had to turn his back on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The emotional toll that it took. But there was a spiritual toll as well. Because the Bible talks about he was being attacked by the bulls of Bashan. Hold your place in Colossians and go to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 22. It's a messianic psalm. And it speaks of Jesus on the cross. And you will get a very clear synopsis of what Jesus was having to deal with. Beginning at verse 12, he says, Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Now that passage right there gives you just a small insight into what the Lord Jesus Christ was experiencing. And it still only scratches the surface of the agony that he was in physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So if no other reason you say, well, I understand God's holy and he's righteous and he's this, and if for no other reason than what God has done for you, what God has done for me, he deserves that we walk worthy of him. <clears throat> now I know we can get a head knowledge about these things. We can get these things on the surface. We understand them. But sometimes we just don't have a deep knowledge of what Jesus Christ went through, what God the Father went through with his sacrifice. I remember a number of years ago, I was struggling with that. I said, I have this head knowledge. Lord, I, I, I understand the sacrifice you made. I understand the horrible death that you made. I understand you gave your son Jesus Christ. But I want to have a deeper knowledge, a deeper connection, a deeper understanding of what this means. Help me to feel this more deeply. And the Lord answered that prayer. 
And he answered it in a way that has impacted me since the very day. Now, it may come in a way you may not, I mean, it might be a little surprising, a little shocking, or whatever it might be, I don't know. But I was at work when I was making this prayer. That night, I went home, and I had a dream. Now, it wasn't a vision or anything like that. I just had a dream. But the God, but the Lord answered my prayer in that dream. Because he gave me a deeper understanding of what this means. This dream, I was out on a body of water in a boat, all by myself, just sitting there. And my oldest daughter, Beth, was about five years old at the time. And we were here at the church, but I'm sitting in this boat, in this body of water, and off in the distance in front of me was my five-year-old daughter. And she's saying, Daddy, Daddy. And she's bobbing up and down. She's drowning. So immediately as a father, I get my boat, my oar, and I'm, I'm going over to save my daughter. But then all of a sudden I hear behind me, Tom, Tom. And I turn around and I look and there are people everywhere. And I'm like, what? And there were church members or people I knew. There was just this group of people. I'm like, Okay, now here's the choice. I can take my boat and I can save my daughter. And these people drown. Or I take my boat and I save these people. And my daughter drowns because I only have time to do one or the other. And I'm sitting, what do I do? And I look at my daughter and she says, Daddy, Daddy, it's okay. Save them. And she goes under. You get the picture? That dream was so real to me. I woke up in a cold sweat. And when I got out of the bed, I went to my daughter's room to see if she was still there. That's how real that dream was. But it impacted me because it told me how great a sacrifice God made. He said, I can save my son or I can save the world. Jesus said, don't worry about me. Save the world. I'll, sac I'll sacrifice myself. It was a deeper understanding. And boy, that told me I should walk worthy of the Lord. Now, that's not always been the case. We all fail. But Paul's desire is that we walk worthy of the Lord. Why? Because of what God, what Jesus has done for us. <laughs> so, what's it mean to walk worthy of the Lord? Very quickly this morning... Let me give you a few things from our passage here in Colossians <coughs> about what it means to walk worthy of the Lord. Number one, he says that we walk worthy of the Lord in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord. He said that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Paul desires that we walk in a manner pleasing to God. And where does that start with? By being people of faith. Having a walk of faith. Trusting in what we cannot see, the Lord. Not in what we can see, our circumstances. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 5.7 it says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And we know how the Bible defines faith in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If we want to walk worthy of God, then we must be people of faith. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God wants us to trust him and obey him. 
We must be people of faith. We cannot walk worthy of the Lord and please him filled with doubts, filled with insecurities without faith. We must walk in faith. So that's the first thing. We need to walk in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord. The second thing about walking worthy means that we need to bear fruit. Paul says, being fruitful in every good work. And that's what Paul was praying, that our good works would produce fruit. Now understand the good works is an outpouring, an outsourcing of our faith. The book of James talks about how our good works should be coming from our faith in chapter, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. These things were exhibited through the Spirit being within us. The fruit of the Spirit, as Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, tells us that it's the Spirit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Now, if we're bearing the Spirit, or the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, we will live a life that's pleasing to God, and we'll be living a life that's worthy of God, because we'll be doing the works of God. And you know what? Other people will see those works. They will put their faith in Jesus Christ, and we'll see fruit of souls being saved. Because we'll show them the love of God. We'll show them the peace of God. We'll show them the understanding of God. And instead of getting frustrated, we'll show them the patience of God. You understand how patient God is? If God wasn't patient, I don't think any of us would be here right now. Aren't you glad God's a patient God? He's a long-suffering God. And he is a gentle God. Yes, yeah, so we know the Bible talks about his wrath in the Old Testament. We talk about all these. But you know, even in his periods of wrath against his own nation, his people of Israel, he still handled them with gentleness. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. In the book of Zephaniah, where the God gives this promise that he's going to bring his children back. And he wraps his arms around them and he sings to them. Wow. What a picture. That's a gentle God. Those things pour out of us. And that will draw people to God. And we will see the fruit that God is worthy of. But then we get to the third thing. He says he wants them to grow in knowledge. He says increasing in the knowledge of God. You understand the more you know about God. The more you learn about God. His character. His nature. What he's done for you. When you read this book and you pray, you can't help but to love God more. You can't help but to have a greater desire to serve God more. You can't have or help but have a greater desire to want to walk worthy of God. See, most of us, the problem is we don't spend a lot of time in the Word. We don't spend a lot of time in prayer. We look at church as something optional. I can come and go and take it as I please. So we're not growing. We're not growing in knowledge. We're not growing in grace. We're just staying here spinning wheels. And so we have this surface level desire to follow God and to walk worthy of him. And more and more we're seeing people fall into this, this trap where they're being told, do what you want. It's okay. Whatever makes you feel good. We see it in the worship. It's infiltrating our churches. Worship the way that makes you feel good. With no care about how our worship feels to God. We don't care how God wants it. We want it how we want it. That's not working worthy of God. When I come in here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, my prayer is, my desire is not to worship in a manner that's pleasing me. I want to please God. If I'm speaking the word, I don't want to try to impress you. I want to try to impart on you what God has given to me. For his glory and his honor. Not so I can feel better. So I can be lifted up. It's not about me. It's about God. 
And when I start putting myself up here, guess what? That's when God's going to bring me down. A haughty spirit goes before a fall. So we need to walk worthy, but we need to grow in knowledge. And the more time I spend in this word, the more time I spend talking to the Lord, being around God's people, and seeing what God's doing in the lives of other people, the more I appreciate my Lord. And I want, I want more than anything to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want to hear those words, thou wicked and slothful servant. I want to please God. I want to walk worthy of God. Which brings us to the fourth thing. Not only the increasing in the knowledge of God, but we need to be walking in strength. The strength of his might. God doesn't want us walking around as a bunch of weak Christians. There are too many people out there that are weak in our Christianity. We're ready to give up. We're ready to quit. Say, I can't do this. I can't fight the obstacles. I can't face those things. I can't fight the temptations. We're just ready to quit. All the time we say, I can't do this. Well, no, you can't. But you know who can? God. And you know who gives you the strength to accomplish his will in your life? God. There's nothing you and I cannot do with God's help. I wouldn't be here today if God hadn't pointed that out to me. See, when God called me to preach, you know, I said, God, I'm not doing this. I can't. I said, I'm afraid, Lord. You picked the wrong guy. God gave me a verse. Isaiah 41, 10. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. You say you can't do it. You don't think you have the strength to do it because I'll, I'll strengthen you. Say, I can't do it on my own. I'll help you. He said, I'll fall. He said, I'll lift you right back up. I said, okay, God. We're in this together because I know I can't do it. I still can't do it. I would not be here today if it weren't for God. Now, I'm nothing special. I'll just give you that. I may not be the best speaker. I may not be the smartest guy around. One of the best looking. But other than that, we won't go there, right? I may not even be the best looking guy around. But God said, I don't care. I want to use you. Okay. I didn't quit. Why? Because God gave me the strength of his might. And when Jesus was sending the disciples out, he said, I give all power and authority to you to do my will. To walk worthy of him. When we get to the fifth thing, God wants us to walk patiently. He says, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering. How many times have you heard in the Bible to he that overcometh that we're to wait on the Lord. Well God says no matter the obstacles trust me. Wait on me. Endure. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep going on. Patiently. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says for which cause we faint not but, through our out, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And now you get that strength, you get that knowledge, you get that patience by reading the word. By spending time in prayer. And you know what else that does? It gets the next thing. Joyfulness. He says hey, we should serve and walk worthy of the Lord joyfully. And why shouldn't we be joyful? Look at what we have to look forward to. This is not it. We have something so much better. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding internal weight of glory. See, this light or affliction that we're going through now, it's only here for a little while. But we have the weight, the internal glory of God, that we will be there with him. Never to be taken away. 
What a tremendous thing. So we can face these things joyfully every single day. Now I know the trials can be hard. I know that there can be struggles that are difficult. And sometimes we get discouraged. We get feel a little defeated. But when we start thinking about what God has done for us, what God is doing for us, what God will do for us, it should take away all that and bring us great joy. I'm not talking happiness. I'm talking joy. So we should walk joyfully. And then the last thing we're told is that we should walk thankfully, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. The Bible tells us that we're to give thanks in all things. Times of blessing and times of triumphs, we give thanks. That's the easy part, isn't it? But we're also supposed to give thanks in times of trials and struggles. It's a hard thing to do sometimes. But God puts those in our path. Why? To help us to grow. To help us to learn to lean more on him and put self aside. God uses it for our benefit. What's the book of Romans tell us? All things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called for his purpose. That's what it says. So even the trials, we should be joyful. Why? Because God's using them to help us. What a great God we have. Oh, and yes, he is worthy of our walking in a manner that lifts him up. We should walk worthy of the Lord. So my question to you today is this. How is your walk? Same question I ask myself. How is my walk? Have I failed this week? Have you? We all do. We're human. But it's not about one incident. It's about an overall attitude. Do I, do you, want to walk worthy of the Lord? Would you stand with me? Well, stand. And I just want to ask you this question this morning. Do you, do I, represent the Lord every single day, everywhere we go, in every aspect? And if we're not, we need to be Praying, Lord, help me to walk worthy of you. And I know that most of you are home folk here. We have a couple of visitors with us this morning. But I'm just going to open this very quickly, a time of invitation. If you need to come forward and say, Lord, I haven't been walking worthy. Forgive me. Help me in the future to walk worthy. This altar is open. I know pretty much everybody here is saved. They've asked the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But if you're not, you have that opportunity. Let me take my Bible and show you how you can know without a shadow of a doubt that you're saved. Whatever your need might be. I might put a bow if he would come up and play some music. We'll play for a little while while the invitation is open. Do you need to come? Heavenly Father, as we open this invitation up to you. We pray the Holy Spirit would have his will and way. Forgive us where we fail you, Lord. Help us to go forward from this time. Put those failures aside and just focus on you and walking worthy of you. The altar is open. Do you need to come?
right, if you would, open your eyes and look up this way. I want to say thank you again for being here this morning. Now, I would say to our visitors this, thank you again uh, for being here with us. But we're getting ready to have a little, take care of a little business here. So if you would, uh, we'll just um, take a five-minute break. We'll come back in here to the church. And then we'll have our vote that we're going to have, and we'll talk about that when we get in, in here. But we ask our visitors, you're welcome to stay out and fellowship in here, but we're going to come back in, like I said, five minutes, and we'll have our vote about Brother Mike Royal. All right, we're going to pray, and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for this time in your house, a time to worship you. Thank you for being a great God. And I pray you'll... Bless our time of this business being as we go to this vote that your will be done. In Christ's name, amen. All right, be back here at 5 after 12.